We're going through the book of Proverbs. And we said we chose this topic because kids are going back to school and wisdom is an important thing. And even for adults, we want to be wise too. And the best way to be wise is to study God's word. The book of Proverbs is all about godly wisdom for God's people. Each time we've just been starting with a problem just to get our minds thinking. Here's a proverb for us today. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That's one of the proverbs. What's that saying? Just to get our minds thinking the way that the Bible's proverbs think. What is a good thing? Rebuke. What does that mean? <coughs> when someone tells you you're wrong, is a good thing. Especially if the person telling you that you're wrong is what type of a person? A friend. If you have a friend who cares enough about you that they actually tell you when you're wrong, this is a good thing. That's a whole lot better than a bunch of kisses from whom? An enemy. All right? This is wisdom from God. Maybe if you think about it, you can see why, why we need to hear this. Right? Would you rather have people tell you that you're right or that you're wrong? That you're right. All right. But you know what? The Bible says people who don't care about you, they'll often be the ones who just tell you everything you do is good. Yeah, it's good. You're good. That's fine. That's all good. But if somebody really cares about you, <coughs> what are they going to be willing sometimes to do for you? you got to stop this. You can't do this. That's not okay. And, and a wise person is able to recognize that this person I know to be a friend, and they care about me, and they're telling me I need to do something different or change my life. I shouldn't get defensive or get upset. What should I say? Thank you. This is good. And on the flip side, there's someone who I know doesn't really care about me and they just flood me with all these compliments and tell me all these good things. And instead of having that go to my head and think, yeah, I'm pretty good, right? Everything I do is great. I should have this in the back of that. You know, this probably isn't good. Right? Better open rebuke than hidden love. Make sense? And we're going to think about that a little bit as we get into today's lesson. First, though, a little review from last time. Last time we talked about marriage last week. And so just a couple things to review. A godly spouse comes from the, from the Lord. That's what the Bible tells us. That God is the one who brings man and woman together in marriage. A godly spouse comes from the Lord. That's good for all of us who are married to remember. What are some marriage-destroying sins that Proverbs warns us to watch out for? Nagging. Nagging. <laughs> Nagging and complaining and quarreling. That's all in one line. That's all one thing. Nagging, complaining, and quarreling. This is something that over time it's going to tear apart a marriage. And the other big one was adultery. So sexual sin. That's something that's going to tear apart a marriage too. Okay, so a godly spouse is a gift from God. Watch out for things that are going to hurt your relationship. Whether it's complaining and nagging or lust and adultery, watch out for those things. <coughs> Finally, we, we mentioned three special things that God gives through marriage, and we could, could probably think of more than three things. But as we teach marriage from the Bible, we notice three areas that this is something God gives in marriage in a different way than in any other relationship. What were those three things? Companionship. Companionship. First of all, and of course, we have companionship outside of marriage. It's good to have friends and <coughs> brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. But in a marriage, this is meant to be companionship that you don't see other places. Two people committed to each other for life. It's a good thing. <coughs> what was another thing? Children. That's what we're going to talk about today. Right? Children are a blessing God gives often in marriage, not always, but often. 
And the third thing? Sex. And so this is a gift from God. It's meant for a man, a woman, and a marriage. Right? Companionship, children, sexuality. These are gifts that God gives in marriage in a special way. We're going to talk about one of those three things today. And that's children. And so as we're going through this study, we're not going through the book from beginning to end. We're picking out topics and seeing what does Proverbs say throughout the book about different topics. And today the topic is children. And so I've got some passages. We'll just read various passages as we go through the study. Here's one, Proverbs 23, 24 and 25. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. May your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. Here's another one, talking about children. 17 verse 6. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. So two passages talking about children being a blessing. All right, let's think about that a little bit. Agree or disagree, our society looks at children as blessings. Sometimes. I think that's a good answer. Sometimes. It kind of depends. Right? On the one hand, are, are there people who are just saying, you know, children are all bad. All of us should stop having children. There's some who say that. Not too many. I think for most people who have children, those children are generally viewed as a good thing. Right? For most people. Right, why might someone say that it doesn't seem so much that society today views children as a blessing? Yes, sir? Well, the abortion rate. So, with abortion, people look for ways to get rid of children. As if a child is a burden. Or something that isn't, isn't wanted, is undesirable. Alright, and so that's something that continually concerns Christians or anyone concerned about life. Right, did, did, did undoing Roe versus Wade, did it make it all better? No. Does changing laws change people's hearts? No. So if we want people to value human life, it doesn't matter really what the laws are. What do we need to do? Change their hearts. And what changes people's hearts? The word of the Lord. Gospel does. Right? Right? So this is this is something. You look around it. I don't know. Some of you know the stats. How many babies have been aborted in the United States or around the world? And it's Millions and millions and millions, right? So it's hard to say we look at children as a blessing if we don't want children to be born in the first place. Terry? I was visiting, my brother and I were visiting my home in Vermont in the mid-60s. We came across, the downtown lady man was in Iowa. They had kids and they came across uh, eight and ten year old child. And they were both four years and someone had Oh, are these your grandchildren? And they say, no, they're our children. And they say, like, oh, isn't that kind of like that, children? You know, kind of like that attitude, you know. Right. My niece, my niece had one at 41. Good. So Terry gives a good example. He's saying, well, what might make, might make it make, seem that our society doesn't value children? He, he gives some examples of people he's known who've had children when they've been a little older, like when they're 40 or in their 40s and he makes you know he's heard people comment kind of like aren't you old for that you know like why why would you want that i mean someone was 40 and they're so old right and right it's kind of an attitude right why why would you want to you want to start all over again you want to do that kind of like children are a burden all right marissa Kind of piggybacking off of that, a lot of people will have the same response to it. Anyone who has more than three kids. Whoa. Yeah, man. What Except crazy that. people would want to have more than three kids? <laughs> <laughs> one, who would want to do that? All right. And, uh, that's true. So there's 
not a lot of families anymore that have more than, than two kids or one kid. And yeah, so I was just on our trip. We visited, I think I told you the story already, but I'll tell you it again. We visited one of Emily's sisters and they spent three years in Japan. My brother was in the military and they have six children. And in Japan, there's even less children than there are in the United States. And so they walked around with six children and they just described how it was just like they were uh, almost like an attraction everywhere that they went. <laughs> and people would walk up to walk up to them and like, they'd want to touch their stomachs and things like this. <laughs> like, what? what is it with these people? How did this happen? And, and they were kind of thinking, you know, you could have six children too if you just, if you just tried. And, <laughs> So, yeah, just this, well, you know, we'll have one child, maybe two kids, and no more than that, right? And, right? So, there's this attitude, I think we can, we could say that it doesn't always seem like our society views children as a blessing, and there's some stats that would show that. So, I say, how has people's attitudes toward children changed in the last 50 years or so? You can look up all sorts of different things. This is one chart of the U.S. birth rate. And so people, I think, they, they gauge it different ways. This is the number of births per 1,000 1, women ages 15 to 44. Whoever decided that was the category. So if you look back, like in 1920, there were 120 births per 1,000 women. And in 2020, there's 56. So, American women are having a little less than half of the children that they had a hundred years ago. It's kind of interesting to see the chart. It's not like it's all going in one direction. I know it's incredibly small, but there was another time when the birth rate went way down. The Great what time was this? Great Depression. The Great Depression. Right? And then, you know, leading into World War II and and so, so you're right, you're thinking about like the economy, yeah. that matters. And so during the Great Depression, people had less children, and then what do people call this? The baby boom. The baby boom, right? Some of you, the boomers. After World War II, kind of things went back to the way they were. That families were having lots of children. And it's interesting that the big decline, it didn't happen like 10 years ago. It happened like in the 1970s that suddenly kind of attitudes changed about 50 years ago that people had about half the children that they had before. Some of you have lived through that, right? If you have, how would you say people's attitudes towards children have changed, maybe just in your lifetime? Jordan, in your lifetime, it's uh, really changed? No, but uh, demographically, uh, the 70s was <laughs> you know, the time of the agricultural revolution, all of a sudden there are fewer and fewer farmers, so you don't need to have 12 kids to help out with, on the farm all year round. Um, and your people are moving more and more towards the cities where there's generally less room, so people tend to have fewer children because it's tougher to find a place for them all to grow up and have room to run. Interesting. I bet some people would use that. So there was a time when a lot of people were farmers on a farm. It's pretty helpful to have a lot of kids around, right? There's less and less of us farm, and you're going into an office to work, and then kids aren't helpful workers, so they get in the way, right? And just all this impacts our attitudes. Dave? There was a societal movement at that time that was the beginning of women's liberation, and so therefore they began to uh, see being a mother as being something like the woman value. So there were changes in thought at that time. And one of those changes was perhaps that for a woman to say, I want to be a mother, this is, this is an important thing to me, that maybe started to be looked down on. Well, you should do bigger things than that. You should do more than that. Don't just limit yourself to that. Esther? Um, that was about the time the, uh, a lot of uh, media coverage that there was a population explosion. Irresponsible if they had more than two children. And so there was this fear that the world was filling up too fast with people and just going to run out of all resources, right? And so we need to limit people. And, right? China took that to the extreme, right? Yeah. 
think it was kind of around this time that China actually made a law. You only have one child. You don't need all these people around. They've since changed that, but this is fear about too many people. Someone else? John? Uh, this was the time when the automobile was becoming established as the main means of American transportation, and you can only fit so many kids into a station wagon at the time, and then as seatbelt laws come along, you can fit fewer and fewer people into a car that you could have, so it becomes a matter of logistics as well. I think that's true. You know, I, I, bet, I bet a lot of us have limited the number of children. How many can we fit in our vehicle? <laughs> you know, and that sounds, it's true, you know? It, there's limits on how you can do this. Holland? Huh? If the, uh, the birth control pill became widely available. So in the 60s and 70s, birth control, and maybe part of it, that abortion too, but Somewhere. these... The, the, the pill became, you can, you can live the lifestyle you want without having to worry about being pregnant. And this is going to make things better and easier for you. And So we just see this. God says children are a blessing from Him. Of course, a lot of people still feel that way, but maybe as a whole, there seems to be a change. That a large family, that's not the goal. And lots of kids, that's not the goal. You have other things that you really want to focus on. What I want us to think about is, what could Christians do to help others see the blessing of children and family? So if we have, you know, I don't think our world values children like they used to, or certainly the way that the Bible does. What could Christians do to help people when they think about children to say, you know, Children are a good thing. Children are a blessing. Mario? Have really good relationships with your children and grandchildren. So, well, we want to, of course, have, set a model for what, what a family can look like. We're not perfect. And sometimes we can't control the relationships we have with all of our family members. But to project this, you know, if we have children, we're thankful we have children. We don't look at our children like a burden. Right? We're not just waiting for them to turn 18 so we can kick them out of the house and move on to better things. And when grandchildren come, like, this is a good thing. I want to I wanna see them. I want to be a part of my children's lives, a part of my grandchildren's lives. And, right? For Christians to, to, to share that message, that's good. What else, Marissa? Good. And so I know of a lot of Christian couples who adopted a child. Sometimes because they weren't able to have children. Sometimes they wanted to have more children <coughs> when they were past the age of giving birth to children. And excellent point. So when Christians have the ability to adopt children and they do that, and that's, a, that's a powerful thing. Children are a blessing. Good, Denise. When we're in public with co-workers and people that we're speaking, not so much demonstrating to talk about them as being blessings. Good. So when you're with somebody else and they have kids, to, to talk to their kids. To not just, you know, let's put the kids in another room and close the door so that we can, can have our time. And just to make those children feel valued. And you matter. It's not just the adults who matter, but kids matter too. Good point. That's true. Train them. Train them. Right. Explain Train that a little bit more. Train them in the Word of God and, and uh, loving the Lord. Yeah, excellent. We'll get to that in our lesson. Teaching our children God's Word is... Maybe sometimes we have the fear of, well, I don't know if I want more children to grow up in a world like ours is today. Um, that's probably not the right thought for us to have. What does our world need? More Christians. More Christians. And yeah, there's going to be temptations and trials, but our world needs there to be more Christians. And we do that by sharing the gospel. We can lead other people to become Christians, but we also do that by having children and raising up those children in the Lord.
So Christians can do things to support those who have children. You just missed it, but a few weeks ago we had a, a toy drive and we collected toys for Christmas. It's coming up soon. You need to have most of your Christmas shopping done. So we collected toys for kids and great way to encourage positive views about children. We should we should miss that this verse. It doesn't just talk about children. It says children's children, which would be grandchildren. So the Bible talks about this too. And number four, what makes children's children an extra special blessing to their grandparents? You can give them back. You can, yes. you can give them back. <laughs> Somehow that verse did not make it into the book of Proverbs. So spoil your grandchildren and then send them home. But there's this idea, I, I get to enjoy these children more. Good. What, what else? What makes being a grandparent a special blessing from God? Kathy? You get to special presents for them and to give them for your own children. <laughs> you can give them all the things you refuse to give your own children. Yes. But I know a lot of grandparents who just to pick out presents for their grandchildren. This is a special joy. Yeah, sometimes oddly you have a little more money as a grandparent than you had when you were a parent trying to raise your kids. And, and time, you have more time too. You can, you, you're free to do things with them. And yeah. Go to their events. And, yeah, good. So grandchildren are a special blessing too. And of course, if we just think about the, the time back then when the book of Proverbs was written, right? people didn't live as long as people get to live today. And so to get to have grandchildren, right, it's always a blessing. But for people back then, if there was a man or woman who lived to be in their 60s or 70s or 80s and they had grandchildren, this was like an extra special thing. right? Not everybody got to do that. All right, children are a blessing. Here's some more passages. 20 verse 7 says, The righteous lead blameless lives. Blessed are their children after them. 10 verse 1, A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son grief to his mother. And these passages start to get into how there's, there's a reciprocal relationship between parents and children. Right? Their relationship with each other really matters. In what ways are the children of righteous parents blessed? The righteously blameless lives, blessed are their children after them. In what ways are the children of righteous, godly parents blessed? Denise? They see a living example. It's not just words. They're, the parents are walking the walk. Excellent. So for children to see a, a godly example, not just in words, but in actions, this is important. Yeah. When they're raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So when children get to hear about the Lord from a young age, from their parents, this is a positive thing. Right on the flip side, I say, why doesn't do what I say and not what I do parenting work out so well? Don't we sometimes resort to that? Children learn by example, especially really young children. They pick up on what you do just as much or even more than what you say. Okay, why else? Do what I say and not what I do. Doesn't actually work out that well. Esther? They model what you're doing. They model what you're doing and essentially what, what would you be training them to be? A hypocrite. Right? That's what we call somebody who says something and does something else. We call them a hypocrite. And sometimes we parents, we can be kind of hypocritical, right? We have higher standards for our children than we have for us. And what we're really doing is training our children to be just like that. 
I'm going to grow up expecting other people to be this and expecting me to be this. And that's okay. It's also very confusing for a child. It's confusing for a child, too. Yeah, and so, like God says this, godly parents really are a blessing for their children. All right, and we've been blessed to have children. This is what we pray to God for, for forgiveness for our failings, but also strength. God, help me, help me to be a, the parent that you've called me to be. And use that to be a blessing to my children. On the flip side, in what ways does a foolish son bring grief to his mother? Are there any mothers here today who are capable to talk about that? How a foolish son brings maybe not something you want to talk about. But if we have children who end up doing foolish things, why in a special way does that bring grief to us? We want them to we want them to be good. That's what you said, isn't it, Karen? We want them to be good and right, it's kind of it's kinda of odd how it happens, but isn't it true that sometimes right failings that your children have hurt you even more than your own failings do? Right? Really? Well, because then you feel like you failed as a parent. Uh, even though you did your best to teach that child, when they walk away, it still reflects on you, even though it shouldn't. Yeah. But you feel like you failed. You feel like there's <laughs> something that you did that's led to this. Or didn't. Or didn't do. Is that true? Is it true? Yeah. <laughs> not just for you, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but so if parents have a child who turns out to be foolish, is that the fault of the parents? No. Maybe. Maybe. That's the answer. Maybe. If we parents, we, we're not perfect, right? Or it could be a daughter in law. <laughs> it could be the daughter in law's fault. That could really be the problem. Yeah. Uh, or the son-in-law could be there so this this is a, a painful thing when a child ends up taking a route that especially is against God and we wonder why is this and could it be that we sinned in a way or sinned against them and of course the answer is yes and what do we do when we recognize that we've sinned It's supposed to be an easy question. Where do we turn? Where do we turn when we realize that we sin? To Jesus. We turn to Jesus. And for all of our sins as parents, what did Jesus do when he died on the cross? He forgave our sins. So you don't have to leave with, live with parent guilt. Right? Your sins are forgiven in Jesus. We said the answer though is maybe. Sometimes parents can do everything conceivable to train up their children in God's word and they still turn away and that's because they're sinful too those children have a sinful nature because sometimes they choose to be with people who lead them away from God and so because there's a, a child who turns away from God doesn't mean that the parents have done something wrong if they have there's forgiveness in Jesus but this is all something that brings us grief right Foolish son brings grief to his mother. If you, if you have this on your mind, when you read through the Bible, just notice how do the children of godly people in the Bible turn out? And just kind of study that for yourself. And so you have Adam and Eve, and they have children. Adam and Eve, they sinned against God, of course, but they were godly people. They believed in the Lord. What did their oldest son do? Killed his brother. Killed his brother. You say, was that Adam and Eve's fault? The Bible does not hold Adam and Eve responsible for that. Whose fault was it? It's Cain's fault. Kill this brother. You move ahead and you get to uh, you get to the days of Eli the priest. And Eli the priest of Israel had terrible sons who happened to be priests. It was awful. Right? And was Eli responsible for how his sons turned out? Yes. Yes, he was. 
Bible specifically says that he refused to discipline his children. And it was Eli's fault that his sons turned into ungodly people. And so then, now we're testing history, but who comes up after Eli? Who's the boy who hears God's voice in the night? When he, Samuel. So Samuel becomes the, the replacement. So Eli and his sons die, and Samuel becomes the priest of God and prophet of God. And Samuel is this godly man. We don't hear anything bad about Samuel. His whole life he serves till he's an old man. He anoints King Saul. He anoints King David. He's this godly man. And why was it that the Israelites asked for a king after Samuel? They had a specific reason. Samuel's sons were ungodly men. And all the other nations had a king. But you just read that here. Like Samuel seems like the most godly of people. And his sons turned out the same as Eli's sons. And you kind of think, this is surprising how this works. There was a, a last great good king for God's people. The last good king God's people ever had in Judah. Josiah. And it was King Josiah. Josiah just, he was as good a king as anybody ever before him. Josiah is this great king. And Josiah dies. And three of the last kings of, of Judah are Josiah's three sons. And how are all three of them? Just awful. Just awful kings. And they're, they're the ones who, they, this is why Israel gets, or Judah, gets conquered by the many. Right, so it's just interesting to read the Bible and and see how, it, how this works. It, hard for us to understand sometimes. Right? You have godly people whose children are not godly and sometimes it's clear that it's it's because those parents didn't do what they needed to do. Often it's not. Right? And so the proverb, it just kind of states a general truth, doesn't it? Who his son brings grief to his mother. It's one of the realities of having children in life. Just lead us to this. Explain the statement. God has design, designed a reciprocal relationship between parents and children in which both sides are blessed or grieved. How is it that parents and children really work together? When you have godly parents, what does that lead to for children? A blessing. And if there's children who walk in the ways of the Lord, what does that lead to for parents? A blessing. That works both ways, right? If you have ungodly parents, what impact does that have on children? It hurts them. Doesn't mean that they're never going to be believers, that they have no chance. It's not what we're saying, but it hurts them. If you have children who turn away from the Lord, what does that do to parents? Grieves them and right, God just designed this this really powerful relationship. Right, to have children is a blessing from God. If you're gifted with children, right, your relationship with them is going to matter your whole life long. And Proverbs just tells us the reality. Right, just like a marriage, your children can bring you some of the greatest joy or the greatest grief on earth. And Proverbs acknowledges that. Ready to keep going? Parents are worthy of their children's respect. Proverbs has a lot to say about children respecting their parents. 20 verse 20. If someone curses their father or mother, their lamp will be snuffed out in pitch darkness. So we learned last week that Proverbs uses a lot of picturesque phrases. Okay, Does having your lamp snuffed out in pitch darkness, does that sound like a good or bad thing? <laughs> a bad thing. Alright? If you curse your father and mother, it's not going to go well for you. 30 verse 17, the eye that mocks a father that scorns obedience an aged mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley, will be eaten by vultures. Again, Proverbs likes to say powerful things. God's word is powerful. Right? Maybe just dwell on this picture for a second, just to what would it be like to have your eyes pecked out by birds? That would seem that would just be awful. 
wouldn't it? And when you go home and there's birds eating at your bird feed, just, what if my eye were one of those seeds that they're pecking at? It would be awful, right? And that's the point. And God says, children, you're, you're to respect your parents. When children don't, this is a serious thing. Whoever robs their father and drives out their mother is a child who brings shame and disgrace. Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Okay? So we talked about this relationship. It's really important. Parents and children. And the book of Proverbs wants to impress that on children. Children, it is really important for you to respect and obey your parents. Why is it? Why does God take obedience to parents so seriously? Here's just another example. You remember it because I preached a sermon on this like two months ago. So you remember everything that it said. Do you remember we had a, a lesson from Deuteronomy about a rebellious son? I think it was on Father's Day. That's what I chose for Father's Day. If you have a rebellious son, what did God say needed to happen to that rebellious son? Stoned to death. Stoned to death. After a trial, after... You know, having it being investigated, who was supposed to be the first to, to stone him? His parents. His parents. And you said, why did, does God take obedience to parents so seriously? It's a commandment. Fourth commandment. I'm your father and mother. We could say, why is that the fourth commandment? Why, why is that one of the commandments? They are God's They're God's representatives. And this is how the Bible talks from beginning to end. If there's somebody that God has placed over you, the way I treat them, what does that show? The way I treat God. Right? How many of us got to choose our parents? None of us. Right? Who chose your parents for you? God did. Now, doesn't mean your parents are perfect. Maybe you didn't have very good parents at all. But God's the one who put them over you and so the way that you treat your parents, that shows how you feel about God. Right? And the Bible drives us home, wherever your parents are. God wants you to show them respect. This is how you show respect for the Lord. And I think we can think of a second reason. Why does God want children to listen to what their parents say? Because God's our Father. Excellent. And we want to learn what it's like to have a father. And what does God tell parents to do for us? What is, a, we haven't got to it yet. We're going to get to it. What's the biggest responsibility parents have? Train up their children in the Lord. And for parents to be able to train up their children in the Lord, what do children need to do? Listen to their parents. You see how this all fits together? Right? And so this, this matters. The Bible talks a lot about this. Children respecting their parents. Right now, some of us don't live with our parents anymore. How long is respect due to our parents? Yeah. So do you think we're going to have a proverb that comes up that says something like, after you turn 25, disregard all the stuff about parents. Is that going to show up in the book of Proverbs? No. Right? Did you notice one of the verses we had had the word aged in it? So even when your parents are old. Right? And so this idea, you know, my parents are the ones God's given to me. They're not perfect. Me neither. Right? But the way that I care for my parents, this shows my respect and my love for God. Is it easy to care for aging parents? No, it isn't. Was it easy for them to care for us when you were little? Yes, because we were all perfect little children, right? <laughs> That's what you're all thinking. I know it is. It was a piece of cake raising you. I know. All right, but it's kind of interesting how this works out. Okay, parents take care of children. Often there comes a point when children need to really help take care of their parents and Right? This is how the world works. It's good to show respect for, 
for the elderly, for our parents. We said that maybe adults seem to be valuing children less. Talked about that. Do you think children are respecting their parents less too? And we said this is a reciprocal thing, right? And so it's a problem that adults don't seem to value children that much. Okay? You can see how that sometimes leads to children not valuing parents that much too. And how do we change that? We go back to God's Word. Go back to God's Word. Good. What might that lead us to do? Value our children. Value our ch That's a good comment. Sometimes it makes me think of marriage when we have husbands love your wives and wives respect your husbands. If a husband isn't loving his wife, what, what should a wife do? Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a lot that we have to talk about. Isn't there? She, she should respect her husband, and that's going to motivate him, right? To love her back. And so if we want children to respect their parents. If we're parents, what should we do? We should respect them, and right? This is how you build up a positive relationship. Excellent. Right? What this really does is it, it leads us into the next section. All right? God wants children to treat their parents with respect, and we'll see that in the next Proverbs. Okay, ready to go on? I just can't help but so we talked a little about abortion, and so it's easy for people not to value life when it starts. Okay, of course, there's the other end of the spectrum, which is euthanasia or physician assisted suicide. And how is that almost the same as abortion? What, what are you saying? I know better when a life. This life doesn't matter, right? This life doesn't matter, which is, if someone doesn't want their unborn child, they say, well, this life doesn't matter. Let's get rid of it. And it's easy to do that on the other end of life and say, this person has, they've outlived their usefulness, right? And they've, you know, they're just not worth it having them around. It's gonna cost a lot of money to keep this person alive. and. <laughs> Okay, and this is becoming more and more common. I think now there's at least two states where people can travel from out of state to that state to receive medication to die. I think it's Vermont and Oregon, if I remember that right. And I'm not trying to put this idea into your mind, but people can go there who want to die. And so a lot of people say, this is a really good thing, right? There comes a point when Life just doesn't matter anymore. Right? What does God say about that? How long does your life matter? Until he calls you home. And do you think there's something that we might learn from having to take care of an elderly person? What might that teach us that we really need to learn? Patience. Compassion. Compassion. Grace. Undeserved love, and why would it be good for us to learn these things? This is exactly what God shows us, right? I think God wants there to be people who need others to care for them, so that we learn to care for people, which is what God always wants us to do. Esther, I think our society views people um, very valuable, and they think that they should be Alzheimer's who cannot produce anything. They can't remember anything. They can't move. They can't eat without help. If you have that viewpoint, they will produce it. Excellent. So you are valuable as long as you're producing worthwhile things for society. Right? The, it's really a, an awful thing because who gets to decide that? Right? Who decides right, how long we're producing? helpful things to society and of course the Bible tells a different perspective. Where does your value come from? God. God loves you. Yeah, Lydia. Um, along the line of
Great question. So if a person commits suicide, could they go to heaven? What's the answer? We don't know. The answer would be maybe. 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 Because how are we saved? Your grace. By faith in Jesus. We're saved by faith in Jesus. If a person dies with faith in Jesus, it's God's grace that saves that person. Of course, what's really difficult when someone commits suicide is to know whether they have faith in Jesus. Right? And the danger of suicide is that when a person gets to the point of taking their own life, it seems like that could be an indication that what don't they have? They don't have faith in Jesus. Because my faith in Jesus lets me know no matter how bad it gets, there's someone who loves me and cares about me and my life matters. And so this is the danger. Right? That suicide seems to be giving the indication, I don't have faith in Jesus. But we can't look into people's hearts, can we? And so maybe on the flip side, is it conceivable that someone could struggle with depression or despair and just in a, in a low moment of life just make a terrible decision and still have faith in Jesus? Yes. It's conceivable that that could be the case. Okay, and so we, we need to warn about suicide. Suicide is never the answer, and suicide does often seem to be someone has given up on everything, including God. But we can't make that firm conclusion for everybody. Does that help answer your question? So a Christian, we would never, well, just because they're a Christian, they commit suicide, they're definitely going to heaven. That's... What matter? Do they have faith in Jesus when they die? What makes it hard for us is only God can see that. Right? Right? And this is where if we have people that we know are struggling with despair or depression, we need to reach out to them and care for them and let them know that they're valued. And maybe it's people who are elderly, who are starting to struggle with Alzheimer's or dementia. Christians need to reach out to them and make them know that their life still matters as long as God has you on earth. Your life has value and meaning in Jesus. But what if you have a living will where you've gone, you know, uh, you can stay alive on machines, but you say, I don't, don't want to live like that. Excellent. So this is where, with modern technology, it, it brings up a lot of interesting questions of how long, how long do I need to stay alive and how... It's true that sometimes... The opposite is true, that people refuse to acknowledge the fact that they're dying. Which is kind of what you're talking about. And so there's no passage in the Bible that says you need to keep your body alive artificially as long as possible. And so if there's a Christian, right, what God wants you to have in your mind is every day is a blessing from God. God wants you to think that. Every day on earth is a blessing from God. But to die is gain. That to die is an even greater blessing from God. It's both good. God wants you to look at life as a blessing and look at death as the path to eternal life. And so then when it comes to like a living will or the end of life, it would seem from the Bible that a Christian could come up with different, different scenarios like that. So... You know, if you have a condition that, um, what would it be like a, a do not resuscitate order, something like that. That's what you're thinking of, right? Yeah. And so if, if I'm a Christian and something happens to me that really has ended my life, is it okay for me to say, okay? And it would seem from the Bible that the answer would be yes. Because what are you putting your hope in? God's the one who allowed this to happen. I'm going to go to heaven when I die. This is okay. Does that kind of answer your question? And so, as a Christian, I don't want to do anything that would end my life early. But as a Christian, I don't have to force my life to continue on artificially when it really seems like God is calling me home. Does this make sense? And maybe we should say different Christians might come to different conclusions in any given scenario. 
there might be some Christians who this, this thing happens and they say, it seems like this is the end. And we'll accept that. And there might be some Christians who the same thing happens to and they say, well, let's, let's keep this going for a while yet and see what... And we could say they could both, both be done with faith. Does this make sense? Great question. Sam? To me, God's determined the time we're going to die. So whether I hook up to a machine or not, I'm going to die. He's decided I'm going to die. So, so ultimately, we... really can't argue and argument that one direction. In the, in the grand scheme of things, God knows. He's got this all figured out. That takes some of the pressure off of us, right? Sometimes this is... This is hard when it's not you, it's the person you're caring for. And just to take the pressure off, I, I'm really not deciding when this loved one dies. God's going to decide that. Sometimes I have to make difficult decisions. And we do that with prayer and asking for advice and reading God's word. But to know in the end, God decides. This is a good thing. Terry? Well, oh, it's too many, y'all. Uh... My friend and I, back in this apartment complex, he told us about that, that watched a guy play stage four, stage four cancer, and he did chemotherapy, but he died anyway. Mm -hmm. Went right down the drain and got worse and worse all the time. And a lady friend of mine he said to me, he says, stage four, I'm not going to go through this. Maybe I'm in stage three. I won't. Uh, I don't like stage four cancer. No, I think I just say, hey, let, let's not even go there with chemotherapy. Yeah, we can bring up a lot of scenarios. Terry brings up what if someone has stage four cancer, and if they were to say, I don't want to go through chemotherapy, would that be okay for them to say? And again, these are, the Bible doesn't give us a guidebook for this is what you do in every situation. What matters is their motivation. Right? If somebody, you know, reaches a decision with faith in God and trust in God's plan, then that's a good decision, right? It's not, not for us to this In every case, this is what every person has to always do. Right? It's not possible to be able to say that. Excellent questions. Let's move on. I'm glad that you brought those things up. We talked about children respecting their parents. We have to go to children bring a great responsibility to their parents. Here's all the verses that talk about parents and what, what we're to do for our children. 22 verse 6 is a pretty well-known verse. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Bet you've heard that verse from Proverbs. Let's remember, Proverbs teaches us principles, not promises. Remember how we talked about that? Right? What's the message of this verse for Christian parents? Teach your children well. Teach your children well. That's the message, right? If we were to treat this as a promise, which it isn't, it would be, well, if you teach your children the right things, they will all turn up to be believers in God. Is that the Bible's promise? Yeah. No, but the message of the verse is, as parents, what should be our goal with our children? Train them up in the ways of the Lord. And often, when that happens, what sticks with those children their whole life? Training. That training. They don't always make the right decisions, but that training in the Lord sticks with them. Look at all these passages that talk about this. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. So parents, do you ever think about your words like this? Yes. My words to my children are like a necklace around their neck. It's like a crown on their head. This is how the Bible talks. Right? My son, remember Proverbs is really written as, a, as an instruction book for, for young men. My son, keep your father's commands. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over with you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For these commands are a lamp. This teaching is a light. And the corrections of discipline are the way of life. Just think about positively. It talks about what your parents teach you. This is really a good thing. Right? Notice, is it just this, you know, it's a son. Is he just supposed to listen to his father? No. Who specifically mentioned? His mother. Right? And, 
It's like the fourth commandment. It doesn't just say honor your father. It says honor your father and mother, both parents. Both parents are to be respected. Do you ever, I, some of you do this, but I'll meet even older people and you'll talk to them and they'll say, yeah, but just like my dad always used to say. You hear people who say that? You say that? Or someone will say, you know, I, I do it just the way my mom used to do it. And is that a good thing? Usually, usually. <laughs> you can think of some exceptions. But usually this is a good thing. Right? God wants this. He wants parents to cut everything that I say and do. When my children are present, I'm, I'm training them. And I want them to remember this. Right? God wants them to remember it. It just shows that they are watching and listening. They're watching and listening. Yeah. Often when we don't think that they are. But they are. Right? Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. So we're getting used to this, right? Father and mother, and even when they're even when they're old. Alright, children, this is a good thing. I heard this agree. Parents are to let their children decide everything for themselves. Sure. <laughs> so it, this is this just this is kind of how you, you get the feeling our world thinks today. And this is crazy. Okay, the Bible is, does not say children should decide everything for themselves. Who should decide most things for their children? Their parents. Their parents should. All right? Because, well, we should add a reason. Why? Because we know. Because parents are given by God wisdom that their children don't have yet. Okay, now, there comes a point when children need to grow up and they need to start acting like adults. It's true. But especially when children are young, they need their parents to decide things for them. Why is it so hard for children to listen to their parents? Because children always know better, right? Why do we think that we know better? Very soon. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. No matter how old you are, you're as smart as you've ever been. <laughs> and you think other people should know that. Right? <laughs> I know more now than I ever have before. Uh, good point, John. We're full of sin. We're full of sin. That's the simple, true answer. We are full of sin. Right? Children don't want to listen to their parents. Kind of like parents still don't want to listen to their parents or anybody else. And this is our sinful nature. God's put people over us. He wants us to, to listen to. What amazing gifts has God given us through our parents? Life. Life. That's what the passage said, wasn't it? Listen to your father and gave you life. God gives life, but he gives it to our parents. Beyond life, what other things have our parents given us? Wisdom. Wisdom. Good. Love. Faith. Your faith. God's word. Shelter. Yeah, you're, you're all thinking of really like spiritual things. I was thinking of food. <laughs> and clothes. And a place to live. And rides all over the place. And, right? God wants us to look back and think, this is a blessing. Right? No one's perfect. But this is a blessing, how God set this up. The last section then gets into one of the things that Proverbs is known for, and that's Proverbs says parents need to discipline their children. And it kind of fits with everything that we've been talking about. Even small children are known by their actions, so is their conduct really pure and upright? What does this verse teach us about children? Yeah, and children are just as sinful as everybody else. Is there like, you know, you're born kind of innocent and then you have to reach this certain age before you're capable of doing anything wrong? No. All right, children are sinful. But that's the excuse you give. That's the excuse there. Yeah, they're just, they're just, they're just kids. They, they don't know better. 
The Bible says even, even children are known by their actions. Right? God, he's got the same standard for everybody. And this is why Proverbs says things like this. Whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. They just keep going. The rod and a reprimand impart wisdom, but a child left undisciplined disgraces his mother. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. And do you sense a theme? Sure. God wants parents to discipline their children. And this, according to the Bible, is love. Remember how we started? The little proverb I had at the very beginning? What's a good thing? When someone rebukes you, even as adults, also as children. Okay, now we could talk a long time about the word the rod. All right, there's lots of different ways to discipline, right? What type of discipline is the Bible talking about here? Actual physical discipline, corporal punishment. All right, that seems to be discouraged in our society today. Right? What might be a valid reason someone would be concerned about this? There's real abuse. Is, is the Bible in Proverbs telling you to abuse your children? No. Is the Bible saying, well, this is okay. You can just beat them however you want to. That's good. Is that what the Bible saying? No. What would be different between discipline and abuse? Yeah, excellent. The attitude. Love versus anger. Right? So if a parent is angry, what should they probably not do in that moment? <laughs> Discipline their child. That's a time for a parent to say, we're going to both go to different places and we're going to deal with this later. We need to calm down. Okay? So the Bible is not encouraging parents to, to, to harm their children or abuse them. Don't let someone say that that's what the Bible's saying. But the Bible does say there is a place sometimes for physical punishment. Right? And, um, not meant to hurt, but meant to train. Um, some of you have had little children. Do little children listen when you reason logically with them? <laughs> no. Sometimes all it takes is just a, a little a little pat on the backside. And what do they begin to understand? This is bad. This is bad. Sometimes I don't think it even hurts them. But just just that feeling, they realize this isn't good. Okay, the Bible says it is okay for parents to use corporal punishment, but it must be done in love with the goal of training our children. Ironically, you realize in the Bible, corporal punishment wasn't just for children. Who was it for? Everybody. Every crime in the Bible was punished by what? Death. <laughs> Not death. Some were punished by death. That was the ultimate one. But there were beatings. There were lashings. So it's not just we're going to do this to children. It's if you steal something, what, what's going to happen to you? There's going to be physical pain that's going to be put on you to teach you not to do this. It was for everybody, right? Make a difference. And of course, that was the way it was in a lot of places. Do you know what they did not have in ancient Israel? You like a chair? Prisons. Jails. Nobody went to jail. If you committed a crime, what happened? You got punished. And then you went back to life. Right? It's just a totally different mindset. Okay, but then we're, not, we're going to lock you up for 20 years in jail. That never happened. Okay, you get later in the Bible, and the Romans sometimes put people in jail, but usually the Romans put people in jail if they were awaiting their trial. Right? But then the sentence was carried on. You're going to be beaten or whipped or killed. And otherwise, you're going to go back into society and just 
Okay, you have to understand there was a whole different method for this. And of course, in the Bible, the, the goal is good. Right? Why does God say that if you don't discipline your children, you actually hate them? <coughs> if you really care for someone, you care about what they do. You care about what their actions are going to lead to. All right? And so this is the Bible's encouragement. You're, you're a parent. God commands you to discipline your children, but doing it out of love, always concerned about their eternal welfare and one more verse. I know we're rushing here at the end, like usual. One more verse. Proverbs 3.12 says, The Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. I think this puts all this into perspective. Who also is constantly disciplining? God is constantly disciplining us, right? He allows things to happen. He doesn't allow other things to happen. Sometimes does God let us feel pain? Yes. Does sometimes God cut things out of our lives that we want? Yes. And what does God always do it with? Love. Okay, and if we're going to learn from our Heavenly Father, I, I love my children enough to stop them when they're doing something wrong. I love my children enough to say something when they're turning against God. And I do this not because I'm perfect, but because this is what God's done for me. Right? It's a wonderful thing when someone who loves me tells me that I'm wrong. I need that. Thanks for your discussion and questions today. Great to have all of you here. Come back again next week. Next week is Labor Day weekend. I think it is. Am I wrong? All right. Ready? Next week is Labor Day weekend. I'm celebrating Labor Day weekend, whether it is or not. And next Sunday, we're going to talk about what Proverbs says about work. So work is one of the topics. Proverbs has all sorts of things to say about it. So next Sunday, we'll hear about work on Labor Day weekend. Let's go over the prayer. Dear Lord God, one of the, the most special relationships you've created is between parents and children. Not all of us are married like we talked about last week, but all of us have parents. And Lord, you tell us that godly parents are a blessing to their children, and godly children are a blessing to their parents. And Lord, we have to confess that as parents and children, we're not perfect. We've sinned against each other. We're thankful for your forgiveness in Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you bless the relationship between parents and children in our lives. Help us to respect our parents and grandparents, no matter how old they are, what care they need. Help us to love our, our children, even love them enough to correct them and discipline them. And Lord, when our parents do the same to us, give us humble hearts that are, are thankful when, when a friend rebukes us and points us back to you. Uh, dear Lord, bless the, the families in our congregation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.